thank you everybody for being here and I thank you to the MSP for organizing this and allowing us to come and have this uh, very interesting exchange. Can, can you hear me all right when I turn? Okay, good. Um, so, um, this is uh, the, the work that I will be presenting is a work that's, uh, that's been going on for a while. Um, and uh, we've done uh, as part of a coalition of organizations for the right to water. Um, and, um, it's, um, it's a coalition that started out in 2005 as a strategic alliance with um, different NGOs and social movements to push for the right to water and also for um, participative management and water privatization. Um, so I'm going to give a very brief um, introduction about what Mexico City's water issues look like. If you were here from the previous presentation, there are some um, elements because, of course, this is an introduction of what's going on in, in Mexico City. Uh, when the Spanish arrived, they saw this, Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan uh, was an Aztec city that was built on small islands and uh, mostly lakes. It was the, the Venice of the Americas and it uh, basically um, was progressively and intentionally right out. Um, so during the 16th century you still had quite a bit of lakes but then uh, as urbanization progressed, um, you barely see any um, water there anymore. So from being a city where the biggest problem was flooding, it um, has now become a city where you've got lots of different uh, problems, including lack of access to a lot of of the population uh, and uh, mostly inequality in this access, bad quality in several regions of the city, and uh, a bit of what we also heard in the previous presentation in, in Jakarta, where you've got sinking, sinking of the city because of the over exploitation of uh, the groundwater. So, this is, of course, an important risk to, to infrastructure and people. You also have uh, important water pollution of um, uh, surface and underground, uh, underground sources and uh, very poor management <coughs> of, of sewage. Um, it's important for me to say that this presentation is mostly, no, not mostly, is only about the federal district. The federal district is a, a part that you see yeah. in, the, in the slide. But you've got the metropolitan area, which is, of course, the, the gray area with all the urbanization, which includes uh, much more. So Mexico City is much more than just the federal district, uh, totally connected with the urbanization happening in the state of Mexico. Uh, but the federal district has its own administration. And since this is a process um, only that we have the opportunity to work with Mexico City's government, that's why I'll be focusing on that. So, um, besides the, the, the things that I have mentioned around um, issues in, in water provision in Mexico City and in the federal district since the, um, 1993 has had uh, private companies participate in um, water management. Um, you can see that uh, there are some known names there in the partners that uh, participate in the water companies. Um, so you, you see Veolia, you see Suez, and you see some um, national um, companies um, uh, joining with, uh, with these transnationals in the administration. <coughs> what this looks like is very... Um, uh, Unique. They subdivided the what, what's equivalent to municipalities in the federal district. 
uh, the way they're, they're called delegaciones, but we'll call them municipalities for, for simplicity. And they subdivide these municipalities uh, in regions, and each one of these um, uh, companies administrates one of, uh, of, of these. Um, but they only do uh, commercials, uh, commercial issues within the water system. So they do user registration, they do metering, billing, and customer service. They don't manage the infrastructure. Uh, they, it's very, very limited to, to service contracts. So what is it that we've been doing as, uh, as a coalition trying to engage in different advocacy processes to improve the, the water system in Mexico City. Starting in 2007, uh, the Coalition of Mexican Organizations for the Right to Water has engaged in, in different processes uh, within the city. Uh, these processes are uh, larger than just water, and uh, it includes human rights, diagnosis, the, um, the process of, of writing a human rights program, then trying to implement that program. Uh, then we had a, a working group for transparency, and now we are in a second phase to try to implement that program, which hasn't been implemented yet. Um, so, uh, regarding the human rights diagnosis, this was a very innovative uh, participatory process that was initiated by the representation in Mexico of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner uh, of Human Rights. And um, there was participation of the local uh, Human Rights Commission, which is um, fairly progressive and the uh, direct involvement of the government agencies of the city, uh, academia, NGOs, and also CBOs. Um, I need to say that the federal district has had um, left-wing governments since uh, 97. Um, there's uh, certainly lots of limits to this left-wing government, but there's a little bit of an opportunity and there's certainly a discourse that favors um, human rights and so on. So it's, it's been an opportunity to try to make some, some change. And since the very beginning, this diagnosis was, uh, there was a common agreement to consider the highest international standard uh, for, um, for, for, for understanding human rights. So the, this diagnosis was not specific to water issues. It included housing and environment and um, lots of other uh, human rights. And, uh, but we, specifically as um, COMTA, only worked in the water issues. So the diagnosis uh, recognized the lack of sustainability in the water management in the city, the inequality in the service provision, the problems of, of water quality, the billing mistakes made by these, um, these companies, private companies that are managing the commercial system, the pollution and the over extraction, and recognized something that hadn't been said, um, uh, that more than one million people in the federal district lack of, of, of constant water provision. Um, maybe they have water available only once a day, so they might have a pipe, but the, if you open the tap, you might only have once a week at 4 a.m. in the morning uh, water for a couple of hours. So, of course, this is a huge problem. Um, so, this is something that hadn't been said. All statistics were about how many people had piped <laughs> water and not necessarily about um, the problems in, 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 in the water coming out of the pipe. So then the next step was, okay, we have the diagnosis, we, we know what's going wrong, and now we need a program to change it. What do we need to do in the city to, um, uh, to change this these issues are going on. So it was also a participatory process. It followed like the, the, the 
all the spirit of the diagnosis. It was very interesting. Lots of tables where we were discussing with the water management directly saying, why is this happening? How we can change it? Things like this. Um, uh, it established clear objectives, strategies, committed action points of what needed to be done in each of these human rights that were analyzed and identified who needed to do it and in, in what time. Um, so for the right to water, it identified the problems that we've already talked about, but also a, a, a very important focus is in sustainability, which might not be such a traditional thing to think when thinking about human rights, and also the importance of supervising the private water companies. Um, then a follow-up mechanism was put in place to uh, see the implementation of this program. And then we started with huge problems, of course. So the program was the program was compulsory, yes, and uh, the government should know that it was compulsory because it was in a decree and further along it was in, in the law. But most public servants were unaware of the compulsory nature and they were not actually very interested in, in implementing. And we had a like two or three discussion tables and they didn't want to disclose information. They questioned whether they had to do this and they, uh, there was absolute lack of willingness to do something about this program, which was very exasperating because we had had these conversations with, with them about what we wanted to do, how we were going to do it for a very long time before actually implementation. But anyway, so we were very frustrated, but then it came along um, the opportunity to work in um, a, a working group for transparency. This was a different initiative pushed by the Transparency and Access to Information Institute in Mexico City, um, with also the support of the Subsecretariat of, of, of the government. And uh, there was a clear agenda of the city major that said we need to be more transparent. Uh, so we used, of course, the diagnosis that we had for the human rights as, as it did a specific analysis of transparency regarding three issues, water tariffs, water quality, and private companies. So this was much more specific, like, okay, you don't have the contracts in your web page. We've got these companies managing the city and we don't, we don't have access to see the contracts. So we want those contracts in your web page. And we want to see the water quality that we have in different regions of the city and we want that up in the web page so that people can access it and know what's the quality of the water in, in their regions. And it was very interesting because um, they actually accepted our proposals publicly and they said we're going to go ahead and, and implement them. And um, of course there was some negotiation in the implementation in the sense of, well, maybe we cannot publish uh, that much detail in water quality, but we're going to publish some other things in water quality. And But there was in contrast to the process that we had previously had, which was totally frustrating, where they were questioning whether they were obligated to fulfill the, the program. Here, we had very important problems. We have now in the web page the, the, the public um, um, acknowledgement that there are water companies managing the city, which wasn't there beforehand. <coughs> anybody can now know them. And we've got how they, the, the city is subdivided and what they're doing in the city and things like that. So it's a little bit of a progress. Um, and then, well, the question is, what happened? What, what was different from one process to the other process? And uh, one of the important thing is that the, there were agencies uh, uh, like the um, Undersecretary of the Government and the Access to Information Agency uh, really pushing the water system, you need to be more transparent. You're not complying even with the, the transparency law. You have to disclose more information and so on. So this was, they were supporting our agenda from, from the civil society, which was very good. 
we had this high-level dialogue. We were sitting in the same table with the general director, questioning their, the way that they were working. And the general director assigned the work to other public servants that could actually implement what we were talking about. So that was uh, very good. We had media present and, and more stakeholders involved in that um, working group for transparency. Uh, in contrast with uh, with the other uh, process that we were taking ahead, but I think that the key thing here is that the complexity of the issues are not equal. Tra making transparent the information is very different than implementing human rights. You need to have transparency as part of implementing the human right to war, but you need much more than just transparency. You need participation, you need to change a lot of things in management, you need to change the paradigm of how you're providing water, you need infrastructure, you need lots of other things. And here, transparency is just paste it on your website, please, right? So we can further engage with you, right? So, um, it's, uh, um, so we're now trying to implement this program where there's some uh, hope on that, but um, I need to wrap up there. Um, but I do need to say that although we've done a lot of work, we've been discussing with the water system for a long time, we have learned a lot and so on. Unfortunately, the conditions of water provision in Mexico City have not changed. And that's what we're trying to change. Uh, and uh, the, the, the water system still doesn't have a clue of what we're talking when we're talking about uh, participatory engagement, when we're talking about society, uh, being part of decision making and so on. So although we've managed to accomplish some things um, regarding transparency and more information available to keep up this dialogue, the truth is the lack of water quality, the lack of water provision to a lot of people in the city is still a reality. So um, there's lots of work to be done still, but there are some small opportunities for